Sarah. Sarah, so what, uh, where are you from originally? I was born in South Bronx. I grew up in Brooklyn. How long have you been out here? I've been in LA maybe about two months. Oh, you're brand new. Yeah, I've been in California since July. And then I was in Vegas May 12th. I came to Vegas. That's obviously the first time I'd ever even left New York City. Wow. Yeah, pretty crazy. And uh, tell me about your childhood. You grew up with um, parents? Nope. I actually was found as an infant in a trash can, hours old. And um, I wasn't born in a hospital or anything. I was born in a public bathroom and thrown in a trash can. I was found by the cleaning crew. And um, I grew up at Brooklyn Home for Girls. You grew up in a home for girls? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Brooklyn. I was the only white kid within, white person within 10 blocks. And uh, when I was born, I was kind of funky. Um, she had me on her own in a public bathroom, so this leg was turned in like this. I just said, I'm not sure that is. Right. So I had like, uh, like Forrest Gump leg braces my whole life, um, which makes it extremely hard. I mean, I grew up in a like Brooklyn home for girls. There was at every time, minimum 100 girls in there, ages birth to 18. There was only six nuns that ran it fucking shit show, complete shit show. Girls were literally like trampled to death over food. There, there, we had at least a death a week, every week. Really? Uh, absolutely. And this was in the 80s. I mean, I'm gonna be 38. So this was, this was, it was pretty morbid. So now mind you, I'm a little white kid and I get 100% Jewish blood. I mean, look at me. Um, nuns hate Jews who killed Jesus, right? So um, not only that is that I'm crippled too. And, I mean, I was very crippled. Like, I mean, leg braces, thick coke bottle glasses. I was, in the home. I was the ugliest kid you ever fucking seen in your life. <laughs> like the you ugliest kid. Ugliest kid in the world. I was pale, pale, pale white, frizzy curly hair. I was a fucking hot mess. So, <laughs> um, so no, but mind you, I was there since birth. So um, having these leg braces and everything, they never, like, they didn't take time to teach you things. You know, like, oh, this is how you use a spoon and this, that. No, they, so they never, like, helped me go to the bathroom, like, potty training, stuff like that. With these leg braces, it was a bitch to use the bathroom. And um, so every time I'd have an accident, they'd bring me in the bathroom, strip me butt naked, and beat the shit out of me and leave me there all night. So I identified at a very young age, at three years old, that if I don't eat or drink, that I would have accidents so I wouldn't get beaten. And I was diagnosed with anorexia at three years old. And just from, yeah, just from, I didn't want to, you know, be, I just didn't want any attention. I just wanted to just fade into the background, you know, just, um, but I was treated like just kind of extra, like heinously. Um, I was also, I had third degree burns at eight years old from a pot of coffee that a nun threw at me because she said we had personality conflicts. I was uh, then sent to Boston Children's Hospital. I spent three years there. Um, I was in a wheelchair for those three years. They ended up re-breaking parts of my body and my back and my hips to straighten me out. And I had third degree burns, I had skin grafts, so half my boobs fake and everything. Um, so that, but you know what's really sad is um, those three years I spent at Boston Children's Hospital, I actually think those were the best years of my childhood. That's the first time I ever had, I mean, I never had a birth, I've never had a birthday cake ever in my life, even to this day, but I got um, Christmas presents. I didn't even, I was never allowed to participate in things like that because I was Jewish. So it was pretty crazy. It was pretty wild. It is. Yeah. And um, so it was pretty cool. Um, you know, I survived. I, I went through and I, you know, that was one thing. I would walk everywhere. I don't care if I had the nicest, most beautiful car in the world. I will park that bitch and I will walk. I will walk it out because I know what it is to, like, not be able to. And I'll never take, like, physical things for granted. You know, like, I've really been compromised more than once physically. And uh, this life, life's short. You know, if you can do it, get up and do it. I mean, 38, I'd had four kids. I'm in the best shape of my life. Yeah, you're amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, with that, all that, now, group of both girls. Um, my first love, first time I ever had sex, I got pregnant, 15 years old. Um, nobody, nobody knew I was pregnant until three days before I had her. I hid it because um, I was afraid I was an orphan. I was afraid the state would take my kid and everything else. I was just scared. Not even um, the kid's father knew. Um, and you know, this is back in the day of Janko jeans and the big, you know, sweatshirts, and it was, it was, it was winter time, so I'm, and I know, mind you, I grew up on the East Coast, so we had winter, it was serious. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just able to hide it. I weighed 141 pounds, nine months pregnant when I went to go have my baby. My baby was seven pounds, one ounce. That's the biggest I've ever been in my life. That's crazy, right? Nine months pregnant. She was perfectly healthy, 100%. Yeah, 100%. I had her, got pregnant at 15, had her at 16. Now, mind you, she was born, all my daughters were born on holidays as well. So my oldest, my firstborn, was right on her due date, which was Memor May 28th, Memorial Day 2000. It's pretty cool. Um, I was 16. I never even held a baby until I had one, so that was pretty mind-blowing. 
Um, now, on my 16th birthday, just before I had her, on my 16th birthday, November 7th, I uh, emancipated myself from the state. I became my own like guardian. I got my driver's license that day. I signed my first apartment lease. I went to high school that morning. I worked at Pizza Hut that night, all being pregnant that day. And nobody had a fucking clue what I was up to. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. That was pretty epic. Um, I graduated high school a year and a half early, valedictorian of the school. Um, the school was so, and now my job was pregnant with my second kid at that time. I got pregnant at 17, had her at 18. Um, the school would uh, kick me out. They wouldn't let me march to the class. They actually mailed me my diploma. And uh, I, was just, I was really, it was really hurt by that, you know? While I was breastfeeding, everyone was up to prom. While everyone was graduating, I was popping out another kid, you know, it was, it was rough. I had my second daughter, uh, Tatiana, Easter Sunday, 2002, which was March 31st. She was amazing, epic, um, Easter Sunday. She was actually the only baby born in New England that day, which was pretty cool. Yeah, she got like a special thing from the president. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's Tatiana. And then, um, yeah, I graduated high school. I was always with my kid's father from the time I was 15 right up until last summer. Um, so that's, it was 22 years. Crazy. Um, love of my life. He's the father of all my kids. He's loving my life, absolutely. I had my third daughter, um, Justice, uh, 4th of July, 2004. And then I had my last daughter, Jacqueline, Mother's Day, 2006. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, I did really great. I was super smart. I, graduated. I have four master degrees. Um, I did culinary, hospitality, small business management, and marketing. I actually owned my own dress shop in um, New York City Custom Dress Shop um, for about almost 15 years. Um, I also had like catering on the side. I specialize in expensive parties, bar mitzvahs, weddings, stuff like that. So let me back up a little bit. You, yeah. you never had any family or parents? No, not at all. I still don't. Nothing? Nothing. Not from birth, did you have anybody? No. Zero? Zero. I was put in the trash can, yeah. Okay. Literally, yeah. This is emotional support, like stuff. And like one thing I the remember... Trash can was your, was your yeah. mom? Yeah, yeah, literally. And um, they don't even know how I survived it. It was, it was crazy. But uh, you know, now my job was extremely small, malnourished, everything. You know what I mean? It was a shit show. Now, I guess my real mother, I mean, her family had no idea. Nobody had a clue. Um, it, was, it was pretty crazy. Um, yeah, that was pretty crazy. And uh, it, was, it was very, now one thing I remember as being a child is that like, even now to this day, it kind of fucks with me, is that I, nothing was ever mine. Like, like in, the, in the home, like there was a bit of underwear, there was a bit of shirts, there was a bit of friggin' pants. We had the like jail rollout mats for beds. Um, I wasn't allowed to touch the silverware or the, the plates or anything because I was a dirty Jew. Uh, I wasn't allowed to sit on the, on the furniture. I wasn't allowed to sleep on the mats. I was legit treated pretty much like a dog. Um, when they, the, kid, they had the kids outside to play, they hooked me into a dog runner. Sometimes they leave me out there all night. I'm terribly afraid of the dark, terrified of the dark. I have an issue with bathrooms, like really just a horrid fear I can never close the bathroom door. Um, I've always just got the shit kicked out of me in bathrooms and I don't want to die in a bathroom like that. It scares me, That's a, that freaks me out. Ever since I was a small kid, I just identified that and I just, I, I still to this day, I mean, I'll go nine days without eating a single thing. But I'm constantly drinking things, but I, I just, I don't, I literally don't get hungry. I don't know what the sensation of being hungry is like because I just voided it out. Because, you know, when you're starving, it hurts too much. You just void it out, mind over matter. I do truly believe that I can manifest, I'm capable of anything I put my mind to, but I just can't seem to get the fuck out of my own way lately, you know? Um, I lost my daughters and my husband last summer in a house fire. All of them. Um, my husband got, re now mind you, I was 100% square. I never even smoked a cigarette. I've never been drunk. I've never gone out clubbing to the bars. I've never done anything in my life that, I, anything, nothing. I don't even have friends. All I did was my family and work, my family and work. Um, my husband got really, you know, he stayed home. He never had a job in his life since we were kids, everything. He was a piece of shit, but he was my piece of shit. Mind you, I'm an orphan. He, he, he didn't leave. No matter what we ever went through, he didn't leave me. And that, that was, I have bed him in issues, you know? So it was, it was really important to me. His kid's father, you know, it's supposed to be, meant to be, blah, 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 whatever. 19 years, we were perfectly happy. We barely even had a conflict, like, of any sorts. He never ever yelled at his children or put hands on his children. I mean, he literally was an amazing man, a fantastic father. He was my best friend, he was my soulmate. He was Jamaican. Um, his name is Demetrius. Um, <laughs> he, now, mind you, as my business grew, I got more and more busy, more and more busy, and I am super Jewish, very cheap. I don't want to pay employees, but I can do it all. <laughs> it's just, you know, a bigger check. So I mean, I was working easily 18-hour days. Now this was um, summertime, maybe two years ago, summertime. 
um, he just started getting like, really depressed, really different, and I could tell something was up with him, but I was just too consumed. Too consumed in money and my career and this, that, and the other, you know, I was, I was kind of a superficial bitch, to be honest with you, and I just I didn't have time for it. And um, I just went about my business. Well, come to find out, well, when I found out, he was using drugs. Um, I found out about crystal meth, he was slamming it, and actually he was slamming it in his neck. And uh, then it turned into very quickly drinking whole bottles. Uh, he was actually slamming liquor at points. He was uh, slamming everything and anything in his neck. Um, when I caught him with drugs and a significant amount of money, I had around 140000 in the bank. And I was down to like nine grand. And when I realized this, um, first time ever, he beat the ever-living dog shit out of me, tied me up, and uh, he's shot me up with heroin for the first time. That's actually a scar in my neck. Um, that's over two years old. And um, I'm going to go away. He did it there because um, he was, at this time, domestic violence started. Started bad. Um, it went from zero to 100, like really quick. Now, Demetrius, the reason we never really like party got into drug stuff, um, he's schizophrenic, which he told me about, and I always knew, but I never saw like any um, anything alarming or anything signs of that. You know, and people with mental disorder, especially like that. No, he's a hardcore schizophrenic, like scary shit, like a whole other person inside of him. He took medication. He always took medication as long as I knew him, and it was never an issue. And um, he stopped taking medication started using drugs and it just it got really bad it got really 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 bad um not last summer the summer before so that would be what 2017 he was strangling me daily unconscious putting me out completely unconscious now the thing with that is like being strangled is something that's very very personal you know and it comes a point and you're like you're looking up at this person a man that i love more than anything the father of my children and you accept it you stop struggling you you literally just like it's you you stop you you literally accept whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen that does something to you mentally and especially i mean sometimes it was a couple times a day several times a day he was literally daily putting me out strangling me and um that that's when like i really started having a hard time and um kind of accepting that this uh, he's gonna kill me like this this was it you know he was just he lost his fucking mind it was crazy he was getting uh, daily getting more and more demonic the way he moved, the way his mannerisms, um, not making sense, going into his episodes. You know, before it would be like sometimes a couple seconds, sometimes a couple minutes. Now, now it started to last days. He was leaving me the longest ever was six days. He left me tied up in the bathroom, and um, he put he was putting cigarettes out on me. I have over a hundred of them all over my body, and I was turned into a staff actually, which turned into MRSA, which actually almost ended up killing me. I had holes. Some of them took over a year to even heal. I mean, I have all of my genitals, my boobs, everything. Like, he just, he had some sick obsession with just seeing me in pain. And um, just, it was just evil. And, like, the kids were, we kind of just, I kept pushing the kids away, pushing the kids away. And they really didn't see much of it, believe it or not, they really didn't. Now, mind you, they're teenagers. My kids this year would have been 20, 18, 15, and 13. So, and they just died last summer. So, all of them? Yeah. In the same fire? Yeah. Um, their father set their beds on fire while they were asleep. And uh, he stabbed me five times and he killed himself. He stabbed me? Me five times. He stabbed you five times? I was on life support for months. I actually just woke up February 15th. And then I came to Vegas. Just six months ago, you... Yeah. But see, I mean, you never think that, huh? But, um... Yeah, I didn't even get to bury my children because there was nothing left of them. And it's like my whole life, I, now mind you, 27 years old, I bought that house. I put $300,000 down on that house. It was a half a million dollar house. House of my dreams. Like, it was just so beautiful. It was beautiful. I manifested every little inch of it. And um, the kids and everything. I had a dog, Brody, the only dog I'd ever had in my entire life. He was 17 years old. He was a pit bull. Pits only lived 10 to 13 years. He was 17. He was amazing. The best we called him, he was the only boy. He was my boy. He was amazing, the best dog in the world. I got him when I was 19. Oh, mind you, no, 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 that was the cat. I got the cat at 19. I got him at like 23 or something like that. And uh, just the fact, it was amazing. He died in the fire at the foot of um, my middle daughter, Tatiana. Tatiana was his kid. He died at the foot of her bed, like right there. You watched him do it. Just died, he laid there with her. Uh, the worst part, though, is when the scream stopped. You know, because when you said someone's, my daughter's, the screaming stopped. Because I just, I knew that that was it. I listened to my kids burn to death. So where, where were you when the kids were in the room? Um, I was tied up. Oh, you were tied up? Yeah, and how did you escape the fire? I don't know. The EMTs, they, they saved me. I don't know why. I don't know how. 
I have no idea why or how. So the paramedics? Yeah, no, I woke up, woke up. I woke up in the hospital, and I thought it had just been minutes. I had no idea, and uh, it was six months and three days later. They actually pulled the plug at six months. I had no brain waves, nothing. They, I was considered clinically dead, and they pulled the plug at six months. I actually remember because I could hear the um, the priest, whoever they have, come in and like say something, and um, and I remember them unplugging and everything. I could hear and like kind of see everything that was going on, but I couldn't respond. Now that was the scariest feeling in the world, being like trapped inside your own body. And there was different points in time I kind of vaguely remember, like seeing and being able to hear things, but I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. I couldn't anything. And I had no idea where I was, who I was, what was going on. I just, I was completely lost. They pulled the plug at six months, and I just kept breathing. And there's just, they were actually kind of like cracking jokes, kind of like peculiar. And um, they left out the room, and I actually just like sh woke up three days later. I just like shot up and like, you know, like jumped up and I just kind of panicked. I went to stand up and I fell flat on my face. Um, I was 77 pounds, yeah, 77 pounds. And um, yeah, I'm like- and this was just February? Yeah, February 15th. Or October? Actually, day after Valentine's Day, yeah. I learned how to walk, talk, eat, sleep, shit, breathe, everything all over again. It was awful. So really you're, awful. you're still reading from this, obviously. Yeah, yeah, I'm a mess. And you're here on the street on Skid Row. Yeah. And you're addicted to what? I'm a heroin addict. Heroin. Had you ever tried heroin before this happened? I've never did. I never smoked a cigarette in my life until my husband shot me up the first time. And even waking up from life support, like, yeah, I, w I didn't need it. I wasn't physically addicted anymore, but the first thing I wanted to do was to, I, I needed it. I needed it. I needed it. Now, mind you, I never ever shot up before in my life. So my husband always hit me in the neck. And um, I didn't know what to do. I was a fucking hot mess. Um, actually, a couple street people ended up teaching me, showing me how to do it. It was it was just, well, disgusting. You were, when you first tried it, your goal was just to numb. It was to kill myself. Oh, absolutely, really? absolutely. I was I was furious that they even saved me. I how, why? What the fuck? What, why? You know, like it just it made no sense. Um, now, mind you, now I'm in this like like rehab rehabilitation center and in, in the hospital. Now I'm um, all of a sudden the police show up and they want to ask me some questions. Um, they basically tried to turn it all around and said that I killed my family. And even though forensics proved that it was impossible for me to stab myself from those angles, you know, like the worst one was right here, downwards, with a steak knife. It collapsed my lung and it was like just the tip of it was right on my heart. And um, they, they just thought it was just kind of, it, it was just sketchy, just the way it all went down. And they wanted to ask me some questions. I just, I freaked, I freaked right just out. I mean, not only am I dealing with all these things, like I couldn't even, I hadn't even left the hospital rehab. Like, you know, they told me this, you know, like this is what happened, da da I don't believe you. Like, what, what are you talking about? This is all a bad dream. Like, I just want to you know, go home. Um, I remember the first day, the first thing I did when I left that rehab is I took the bus and I, I wanted to go home and there, there's, there's nothing left, it's, everything's gone. Fast growing, it's, it's fucking gone. Yeah, My entire gone. life is just gone. You have no family to go through. There's whatever. nothing, nothing was salvaged, nothing, nothing whatsoever. It's like my entire life just not, gone. Not a soul in the world would do anything. Not a soul visit me in the hospital, nobody calls me, no nothing. Have a and as the domestic violence got worse and worse, like over the last like year and a half of my marriage, you know, I just alienated even more and more. And you know, he's starting to hold me hostage and shit. Nobody came to check on me, nobody, nobody. The police came to my residence over 60 times for domestic violence in a year and a half. Literally, over 60 times. There's no reason that my children should be dead. They should have helped me, they should have done something. And everyone's like, well, you know, you got you let them back in, you love the abuse, that, that's bullshit. Because that's, you can only do so much. You know, I wrote reports, I put five restraining orders on, they literally dropped them, like, behind my back. Because as an American, you have rights, you, you know, like your everyday rights. Well, this is his residence, this is his address. He's lived here. He has a right to be here. He, he needs means to live. So regardless of what me and him are going through, by law, he's allowed to be there because that is his residence. I had to go through the legal eviction process and divorce him to get him out of my home. Well, how the fuck am I supposed to do that when he's beating the shit out of me daily? He literally broke almost every bone in my body, literally. Like, horrific. That's why I got a tattoo on my face. I got a plate holding my face together. Um, it's, for, it's, it's crazy, it's absolutely insane. Um, I tried everything to help my husband. I truly believed that I could save him. I really did. I couldn't. You know, I was like, you know, you must like the abuse. You know, just, I hate that, those kind of comments because it's 19 years. I mean, he was the love of my life. He's literally all I knew. He, he was it, he's my best friend. 
and he just <laughs> drugs just took him. He was not, he wasn't even a person anymore. He started growing dreads today. We got married when I was 18. He started growing his dreads and he had dreads past his ass. He was ripping him out of his head. There was fucking like blood splatters on the friggin' ceilings and shit. He was like ripping his skin off. He fucking cut one of his fingers off. He was fucking crazy. What do you think was going on with that? Um, he was slamming basalts at that time. And he was just completely demonic. He was slamming what? Basalt. What's that? It's a, um, like a hallucinogenic. It's kind of like crystal, but way worse. Really? And um, it just, he was so, he was demonic. Like literally, like my husband, I could have said, I literally believe that he was possessed, like something took him over. He wasn't the same person anymore. And you could tell this even just by like looking at him and stuff. And like, it was just, he was completely gone. Completely gone. And um, it was it was awful, it was really awful. And what made you come to California? After all that happened, being released from the rehab, um, the police are more and more on my tail about stupid things and they want to talk, check it with this, check it with that. And now my, I've never been arrested in my life. Um, after being held hostage in situations and stuff like that, um, that's actually one of my biggest fears is being like incarcerated or being taken like out of my will and stuff like that. Um, I don't do good with authority. I don't do good with feeling, I hate being vulnerable in any way, any way whatsoever. Like, I mean, the stupidest things. Like when I'd fall asleep, he'd jump on me and burn me with cigarettes. You know what I mean? Like I mean, when I, you say you're naked in the shower, what if someone breaks in, you know, you're wet, you're slippery, like what are you gonna do, you know? You know, if there's no window in the bathroom, I wouldn't go in the bathroom. You know, so, like little things, they seem silly, but it's literally survival to me. Like I literally live every second, every day, like I'm just waiting for it. And it's, it's fucked up. Coming to California was, well, a midlife crisis, right? I lost everything I'm caught pissing or wouldn't throw it out of. I'm completely broke, bankrupt. I lost everything, my business, everything. Um, what does everybody do in their midlife crisis? They go to Vegas. <laughs> I was supposed to get a sugar daddy in a new car. It didn't work out. <laughs> Um, Vegas was fun. Vegas was real. I've never seen anything quite like Vegas. I really had a blast in Vegas. I was actually doing pretty well for myself. What were you doing? Um, I was staying in hotels like every night. You know, I was just hustling. Honestly, I was middleman selling drugs. Um, I was gambling. Um, I've never prostituted. Never, I've actually never slept with anyone other than my husband really? until just this last year. And um, one of them doesn't really count because he jizz in his pants. <laughs> Swear to God. And um, the other one was just a recent thing, and I mean, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> um, but other than that, I just, yeah, so up to that point, I've never prostituted, I've never done like really, I mean, dabbled in drug stuff here and there, even when I was square, but that was just kind of like, you know, get some money up real quick, you know, I'd just take a ride for, with a friend and, you know, drop this off, drop that off, and I really didn't have much to do with the drugs, but I was, I had a clean record, I'm a pretty little Jewish girl, you know, I could get away with a lot of things that, these drug dealers and these people couldn't. I have a perfectly clean record. I've had a driver's license since I was 16. I was just very put together. I was very responsible. I was very together. Um, you know, and that was one thing, you know, like, oh, when I was a kid, I was an orphan. You know, they, the news people go around, they're like, oh, hey, shitty orphan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he's like, oh, like turtles, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and they actually came around, I remember the day, the news people was like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I had a leg brace, I was all screwed. I was like the worst day ever. I remember it was raining that day. And I was, just, I was having a really bad day. And um, I remember I'm like, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna be, but I know every day I'm gonna get up, dress up and show up. I'm gonna be anybody I wanna be. And it's funny because when my house burnt down, the last count I did was I had a little over 600 dresses. I had a new dress and heels every day. Um, and I would, I would get up every day. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty girl, I know I'm pretty, but like, there's, I can take a $5 thrift store dress and I can make it, I can stop a whole room of people. I just had like a certain flair with that. It was something about it, you know? I mean, when a woman feels beautiful, it shows, you know? And I really, um, you know, just addressing heels every day. You know, was, I've never spent more than $20 on anything, anything other than maybe a car in my house. <laughs> I'm super cheap in my ways and very, very thrifty. But like, I'd go to like a thrift store and spend $100 and I could turn that $100 quick into 500 but I need a couple hours, <laughs> you know, like shopping was just a really serious thing with me. And I have four daughters at the dress shop. It was just, it was my thing. Um, majority of those dresses, um, actually when the house burned down, they have around $40,000 is what my clothes were worth. Like just alone, like it was amazing. I had a closet probably about the size of this room. It was amazing, like truly amazing. And uh, it was really cool because like, my daughters were now the size, you know, like they were, they were beautiful. They were um, Jamaican Jews. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> they were freaking beautiful. Tall, skinny, but you know, we we're all petite and everything, you know, so they were getting to the age where they were starting to really get into it and stuff too. So it was a lot of fun. It was cool. We played dress up every day. Um, yeah, I just, it's crazy. I, I really miss my kids. You know, and it's sad. I see, you know, especially in Skid Row, none of these women have their children, probably haven't even talked to their children. And, you know, there is nothing in this world that I wouldn't give just to have five more minutes with my kids. Um, you know, I worked so hard to make a living, I forgot to live. And, um, you know, even like knowing, like I remember specific points when I knew, like I need to talk to my husband, like something's wrong, like he needs a hug, you know? Huh? What was your husband doing? He stayed at home. He's whatever he wanted. <laughs> he was kind of, um, yeah, oh yeah, I've always was the, the pants of the relationship, I guess. But um, he, um, he did a lot of tattooing, that's was pretty much all my tattoos are from him. Um, he didn't really do anything, but he was, a, he was an incredible artist, definitely an incredible artist, and um, he was just my best friend. I didn't care. I supported him. I took care of him. And, um, you know, I've never, I've never been on a date. I'm almost 38. I've never gone out to eat and not paid at least the tip. I've never had a uh, birthday cake. I've never danced with anyone. Never been to a wedding. actually been to a wedding. I've worked weddings. Um, I've never been to an amusement park. I've never Where's been to a birthday? cookout. I've never been to a family function. Did like, you go there? not really. No, we just signed shit at the. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was nothing. I know you never. My husband never gave me anything. Nothing. Nothing ever. Not even anything. And uh, I quote that love. And it isn't about materialistic things. It's not. But he drained one hundred and forty thousand in nine months. And left just everything. So when my house burned down, you know, I had like all everything on set up on automatic bill pay. I didn't, order, I didn't pick, like, open my mail and shit, you know? Um, when my house burned down, I didn't even have house insurance. And uh, nothing was, had been paid in around about nine months. And um, they, they were coming after me for the cleanup of my house. And just, you know, put the cherry on top. And I'm looking at, um, I have a bunch of outstanding, very serious warrants right now that if the police get me, I'm, I could probably do life. And I've never been to jail a day in my life. Um, after all this happened, before I left New York, I mean, I lost my mind a little bit. You know, I, I had a really hard time. I mean, everything and everything, everybody I ever known was gone like that. And I'm an orphan. I got abandonment issues. It's serious. And um, now, I mean, you know, they say it's better to love and loss and all this other shit. And um, I'd rather have never, ever, ever known him at all. You know, I'd rather, I don't think I'll ever even really have sex again. Like, I'm good. I'm done with it. These fucking men, they're, they're disgusting. You know, at least, honestly, no exaggeration, at least five men a day hit on me somehow, some way. At you least. You're in the, you're in the Absolutely, but even, even, even before I was here, I mean, just anywhere I ever was. Like, I even walked down the street. I mean, she knows, I'm sure you know, too. We walked down the street, I could just go to the corner store, and I'm solicited somehow, some way for sex. Well, I mean, every there single there time. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. But, um, you know, at, Every single time I got, you know, it's it's annoying. But not a single one of these men asked me out to dinner, even held a conversation with me, without mentioning their dick within the first three minutes. That's 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 well, alarming. You're, you're, like like you're, you're talking really grown around. grown men, you know, like that that's alarming. And like, I mean, I, I'm pretty. I, I dress, you know. I, don't know, I guess they'd say it's sexy. I'm not really sure, but I've never been like slutty. You know what I mean? My booze, my ass ain't hanging out. I'm not running around here hooking. So like, I don't understand. One thing is like. What the society, like, like even this other girl was talking the other day, and she's like, oh yeah, I met him, she met this guy at a bar or whatever, she went in the bathroom and she sucked his dick. She's like, oh, I just sucked his dick. And I was like, I remember like, it's like a bus hit me. I was like, just, like, she took it so lightly. Like, it was, oh, you know, just no big deal. I just, what? <laughs> like, one in like three people have an STD. That's not even the infections, that, that's diseases. Like, and especially here in Skid Row, I hear this uh, HIV like popping up wicked hard because everyone's sharing needles and everything's going crazy. And um, you know that that's a very alarming number. That is very scary. And um, you know, not everybody. Just, you know, if anybody can have it, it's no longer valuable. You know, and like you can't just let anybody you know run up in you and through you and around you. You know, you are the company you keep. They say, and there's a lot of truth to that statement. You know, and um, I keep like uh, thinking, you know, I'm going to get a tent and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and. I feel like if I get a tent and I, I'm accepting it. Every day I spend here, I feel like I'm less likely to ever leave. And um, this is really like the end of the line, like this place. It really truly is. I'm not trying to be dramatic. This isn't like, 
this is the end of the fucking line. I have seen some of the most this disgusting, the most life. horrendous, saddest things I've ever seen here. And uh, most heinous things. I mean, I actually was even um, beat up by a bunch of guys, almost gang raped and friggin' like drug into a tent and everything like about a month ago. And uh, they kept me there good at least probably 15, 20 hours. But like, it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. It was very d demeaning. And, you know, it was, it was, it was awful. And um, actually, I left Skid Row. This is actually the first time I've come back since. I've been up um, by the airport, LAX. It's like a highway of planes. I've never seen that before. It's crazy. I've also never been on a, like a plane, boat, nothing like that. So it was really, really funky. First time I ever seen a palm tree was May 12th when I went to Vegas. That so was pretty cool. Where, where are you staying at? Um, right now, I'm not staying anywhere. I just wander. I just keep wandering. I don't really sleep. I don't really stop. I just wander. And how do you pay for your hair? I boost mostly, to be honest. Um, I'm very, very thrifty in my ways. Sometimes not, not even necessarily boosting, not even necessarily stealing. You know, I find things. I seem to come across things, like I said, a powerful mind. I really think I focus on something, and it happens. I kind of figure it out. Like, literally, you know, like I found um, a box of um, big packs of batteries, double A's and triple A's. You know, I went out and sold them and this, that, and the other. Brand new shoes, clothing, I mean, you name it. I could turn around, I sell ice to an Eskimo. You know, that's one thing I'm marketing too, and like, I'm just, I'm really good at being thrifty. Making, making a dollar into ten dollars, ten dollars into twenty, you know, and just building myself up. Um, it takes me longer to get there, but I can look at myself in the mirror at the end of the day and know who I am, you know, that, that's okay. And do you have any plans for like the next five years or so? I don't, I don't believe in plans. Plans are made to be broken. And um, any moment, nothing's guaranteed. Nothing's, you know, it's, everything eventually is going to be the last time. I don't even really want friends. I don't even want to get close to anything or feel too much. At this point, honestly, drugs are the only thing that makes me feel anything. And um, it's, I'm scared to come down. I can't, I can't mentally deal with the things that have happened. I've never been to a therapist. I've never seen, I mean, they give me no victim assistance. They don't give a five fuck about me. And I'm America's kid. I'm literally an orphan. They're, they're, where's my crazy check? Where, where's my help? I've never even got a food stamp. I've never got shit. And um, I feel some kind of way about that. Not, not that I feel like anyone owes me anything. They don't. But I'm, I can't work a regular nine to five at this point. I can't even stand being me sometimes, you know? <laughs> it's a hot mess. Um, and with the heroin, and that's very, um, but I'm actually doing really good with that. I'm down to only like $10, $20 a day. And that's keeping me okay. I'm not great, but I'm okay. I'm functioning. And uh, I know, honestly, in my heart that this is a phase. I'll probably wake up random one more because I was never an addict before and I will probably just stop like, like that. I guarantee you, honestly, I probably will. I'm not, I don't know for sure because I can't tell the future, but um, this isn't fun. Like my arms hurt. They hurt terribly. I'm a fucking mess. They, it feels like shit. And my friggin' bums, everything, it hurts horribly. And um, shooting up, but I can compare shooting up to um, self-mutilation. You know, the teenagers and like cutting themselves, very much like that because like the whole ritual of it, it's um, even though my whole world's so out of control, it's one thing I have control of. And it, it helps, it eases the pain, numb and suppress. And uh, when I do get dope sick, when I, when I don't have it, whatever, I do, it's scary. I'm, I'm a danger to myself and others, absolutely. Extremely suicidal, extremely depressed, extremely angry, hurt. I can't handle the loss of my children. I, I really can't, I still haven't. Because um, I never have closure. You know, there's no funeral, there's no goodbye, there's no, they're just gone. And I miss them. Sir, thank you so much for talking about Thank you. I appreciate it. things. They've, they've become great role models for their children and they've become cool people that you want to know, mm -hmm. not, not the kind of people that you want to avoid. Absolutely. And that's where I think you may fall somewhere in, and pe that's why people are reacting the way they are, where it's like, no, this couldn't be for real. Look at her. She's too beautiful. She's put together. She's well-dressed. She's articulate. She's accomplished. She went to four Thank master's degrees. You, degree. you yeah. got four master's yeah. degrees from what school? I went to Boston, 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 uh, but my biggest, I went to, I did classes in Boston, which really intrigued me to push a little further because I had, I struggled. 
Now, I was valid Victorian in, you know, in New York and fucking all this other shit. Now, I went to Boston and I felt stupid. Boston like, College? um, yeah. Uh, the straight, just the, um, community, community fucking, not community, I can't fucking, community, not the community college, but like the, um, not Harvard, <laughs> but it was the, um, you know, like with the community, like the neighborhood kids go. It was like classes. It was like, but now I graduated from York County Technical College. Which is where they, they sent me now. I struggled very, very hard in Boston. And it wasn't even like a Harvard kind of school whatsoever. But I really, first semester, I was ready to drop out. So it wasn't like, Boston College, it was York. It was, you know, well, no, I graduated from York County Technical College in Wells, Maine. Okay. In Wells, Maine. This, is all, this was all part of my rebuilding myself, yeah. you know? What I got out of New York you, and I went graduate? north. Huh? What year did you graduate? I graduated high school, 2002. I graduated college. I had a little ceremony each year because I accomplished such great things through each year, but I got finished, finished college in, two th it was 08? Yeah, 08. Yeah. You can't, you can't. I'm not the same person that. I was. Like, my memory, my everything, I am falling the fuck apart, hon. Like, yeah. I'm losing. Well, listen, you, you just got beaten up. I, I just talked to you a couple days ago, and now you got beat, beat yeah. up since then. I, and I didn't just get beat up, I got this shit kicked out of me. Right. Like, this big fucking fat chick, she just didn't like me. She, I literally never seen her before in my life. This, I mean, big girl. She had um, like a mohawk kind of haircut, tattoos all over her face, and her hair was like lime green. And she walked by me um, on the dead end road that I was telling you where I was staying, and she just said something like, stupid bitch, something, something like that. And I was just like, what? And she just, I turned around, kept walking. She came up from behind me and just whomped me upside down in the back of my head. And I fell flat, and she just beat the ever-living shit out of me. And all these people that I've been living amongst, no, my supposedly my friends, right? I mean, no, nobody did a fucking thing. She, like, she legit beat the shit out of me at least 15 minutes, at least, yeah. like literally, and just kept going and going, knocking my teeth out. And you can't call the police because nope. of what you. Oh, There's you no calling police? cops. There's no calling cops. Because of uh, what you expect. Anything, just anything. You know what I mean? Not stitches get now? stitches, huh? You lost a tooth. Yeah, I have lost a tooth. Oh, nice. Great, right? I've never been to a dentist in my life, and I had perfect, beautiful teeth, and they just been to a shit. I've never been to a dentist in my life. I'm petrified. <laughs> <laughs> what's a, so, what, what city was your family the house in? It's in uh, Summersworth, New Hampshire. Summersworth, New Hampshire. Yeah, but um, it, they didn't get into details of exactly because protection of you know, it's it was a big deal, but there was um, Foster's Foster's Daily Democrat. It's all boiled down. But they didn't get into like the address and everything. They actually protected me a lot. Yeah, and, uh, it was basically a murder. Yeah. Murder yeah, just absolutely. What it was. I mean, he killed the kids. He attempted to kill me, and he killed himself. Yeah. And um, a lot of it was um, now his family. Another thing, you know, there's laws protecting where he where he's deceased. His family needed to be notified before. You know, like there's certain laws like like they can't. You know, like say someone commits suicide or. They, someone commits suicide. Right. They don't go and make it public until the family is properly notified, and then they come out with whatever article or whatever how they're going to put it out to the public if they put it out to the public. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that there were protection because of his family. I knew that, and his family often also was trying to come after me, trying to say that basically I did everything. They, they, they thought it was coincident, that how come I'm alive and they're all dead and everything else. Now, mind you, in all the years that me and him were together, his family never, never, I never met his family. They didn't want nothing to do with me. They were just furious that he was with a white woman. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They wanted nothing to do with nothing until the day that he died. People don't, you know what I mean? They, they're, not, they're not nice to me. People are not nice to me. I am automatically judged. I mean, ra I mean especially out in California, I have never experienced racism as much as I have out here. Um, I have been treated like well, you, shit out you know, here. You're, you're hanging out from the very first neighborhood. Yeah, I've and been and, and, from and one slum to the other. Yeah. I've been here for a few decades. But I mean, how the fuck do I break that? How, how do I get out of this? I mean, honestly, Mark, I would give fucking anything just to have one fucking normal day. Just a normal day. It's just like literally killing me. Like I'm breaking, like I'm fucking going crazy. I literally feel like I'm losing my shit. Like, I've never been beat up, like, what the fuck? Just random, and just people standing around, like, it's, it's a fucking show. Like, it's, and nobody gives a fuck. No one gives a fucking fuck. I'm really pissing blood. Who gives a fuck? I just, I don't get it, I'm just, I'm not like that. I've, in my whole entire life, I've never even thrown a punch. I've never been in a fight. And this girl is just beating the fucking snots out of me, and people are laughing, making jokes. 
And it's all in my spits every time. It's exhausting. It's really fucking exhausting. I don't know what to do. Like, even though, like, I don't want to go back there. But I, where else am I going to go? Literally. Just sit on the sidewalk somewhere? Yeah, well, that's what these people do. And that's what you're doing, basically. That's the point that I'm getting at. Yeah. You know, it's just one dick to the next. And I'm not, I can't even, like, bring myself to sleep with these people. And then I get, um, I was raped, really, overall. I mean, I can't even butter it up any other way. I was straight out raped. I mean, yeah, I didn't kick and scream, oh, no, don't stop, because if I did that, I'd just get the shit kicked out of me and knocked out. But, like, there's nothing I can fucking do about it. They've literally taken all my belongings, shuffled through and kept what they want, and just thrown the rest on the floor no, or on, on the ground. Like, they don't give a and, fuck. And here on the street, the fact that you're white and you're attractive they, they you, want to pick me. Makes you such a target. Yeah, all they, they want to do is just sell you, themselves. You're exactly who they hate. So you're going to get... Absolutely. And I get it. Every fucking you're, you're angle. You're a target for, for so many... Every goddamn angle. The, the women, angle. men, black, white, it doesn't even matter. Every single angle, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, you need to get on the street. I really do. Because I'm telling you, I, I don't even think I could do three more months of this. I really can't. Like, I'm, if you would have seen me even a year ago to now, it's alarming. It's no, you'll, scary. You'll, you'll, you'll be dead in six months. Literally. Either from drugs or from... I'm, I'm lucky drugs, but most likely <laughs> fucking, most likely probably beaten at, fucking beaten or fucking raped to death or murdered, honestly. And it's to that point, like, I mean, I had, like, even after, um, the girl beat me up the, the other day, and then he slept with her that night, he got up, um, I was doing, so, oh, I was cleaning up the dog, fucking, the dogs were barking, dogs, because he's got a couple dogs and everything, too, and I was cleaning up dog shit, and I, uh, dropped a piece, and it was dark out. Dropped a piece and he got up for some reason. He stepped in it. He fucking smacked me so hard. I swear he launched me to the back of that wall. He just with one cuff right upside down my head after I'd already gotten beat up that day. And I started, I was bleeding out my ear, like for him from slapping me so hard. And my, it was like, you know, like bloody nose, but it was coming out my ear. What the fuck? Like, and, and once again, nobody said a fucking thing. You know, you know there's people all around constantly, 24 7. Nobody. They just kind of try to cheat, you know. Throw, throw but who died and made this motherfucker God? Like, why does he's got so much pull and power? Because he's nothing but a, a hood booger. He's nothing but a piece of shit. Throughout your life, before the house fire and your husband losing his mind, mm -hmm. were you basically an unlucky person or a lucky person? Or how, how do you see your... I've never been lucky. And anyway, everything I've ever got, I worked for tenfold. No, Every but, mistake but, I've ever made, I paid for tenfold. Like, I mean... Any wrongdoing doing that I've ever done, I it was. But, but I you, paid had, for. you had a successful business. And you I, I did have a successful business, yeah, but that was really I blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, it was well, really I had to works. work hard for it. Yeah, no, the no, only no. way I really had success and breakthroughs is because I really, not sound cocky, but I really am brilliant. I really am outside the box. Like I can think of something. I mean, give me a pile of fabric and I'll make it into something amazing. Yeah. You know, and um, really, what launched my business, what made my business really successful, which actually is very, very. Um, fucked up to be honest with you is you know the saying uh, shoot your local heroin dealer I actually got an old rickety screen printing machine to do t-shirts and stuff and that was actually when the heroin thing was kind of really starting to like show its face and my kids um, were middle school just starting high school and you know it was terrifying you know heroin's everywhere and da 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 and I was just god forbid you know like, this could be our kids this could be our kids and I actually did this whole little like um, pep rally and like rally with the kids school and um, I screen printed a bunch of t-shirts, shoot your local heroin dealer. And um, it, that's basically what blew my business up. It's like what everybody like me, noticed me, you know? Like, oh wow, you know, she's really on a good track, you know, four daughters and- shoot your local heroin dealer? Yeah, I screen printed a bunch of them, shoot your local heroin dealer. <laughs> Cause this is also my dude, New Hampshire, yeah. kind of a, you know, hillbilly-ish kind of place. Yeah, yeah. And I was new to the area. And now here you are. So, you know, and I mean, it was just something outside the box. You're and um, and it right. launched my business, it really did. I really came a long way with that, and um, now, very ironically, years later, here I am, a heroin addict. Tell me that's not just like fucked, really Fuck. fucked. The the breach of my you know success became probably maybe my biggest downfall. Yeah, the, the other thing that's hard to swallow is any woman whose four kids were murdered by her husband would break, yeah. would break, and you're not you don't seem to be broken. So but so maybe I, you're denying a little bit. Maybe but you're to be honest, maybe I'm you're good. talking from what you came through. I'm just good. Fake it till you make it, you know what I mean? No matter what I've ever gone through, no matter how bad I got beat up, you know, you put makeup on, you still show you, up. You, you might be a perfect example of how resilient the human being can be. Possibly, but I don't really feel it. Not, I really don't saying. feel it. <laughs> and well, no, just really, just recently, and increasingly, like, especially, I'd say the last few months, like, I'm, I'm not playing, Mark, like, I'm losing it.
Like, I'm really starting to, like, forget everyday normal things. Okay. Um, even, no, like, I can't even remember a full day of even being with my children. That's scary. No, eventually you'll get used to this lifestyle and you will end up... That's what I'm starting to, and home. it's not good. The girls that are here. I've debated even get, getting a tent, right? So, so I have my own space so I can keep my shit. But I feel like if I do that, it's accepting it. And if I do that, I'm gonna put all this energy into keeping this tent and da 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 da, and to keep this safe and clean and this that. That I'm going to, I'm gonna die in that fucking tent because I'm never gonna have nothing more. And that's why I just keep pushing and pushing to just roll with the punches. Hopefully, I'm gonna catch a break somewhere. But I'm a fucking Jew. I'm not gonna catch no break. <laughs> I'm the most unlucky woman you've ever met in your fucking life. Like everything that could possibly go wrong in any situation, it's just it does. And everyone's like, well, that's because you put that out there. You put that energy out there. And I'm a firm believer in the laws of attraction and all that. You know what I mean? I manifested everything in my life. We are nothing but what we've thought. I get that. But it's not that I'm being negative, but it's being realistic. Because I can't build myself up and, oh, it's going to be a great super day. But when it's not, it's going to really crush me. So I just need to be like, okay, you know, if, if it does, great. But, you know, if it doesn't, okay. You know, I got to prepare myself for the worst because that's what I'm used to. Sarah, thank you for coming back and Thank you. clarifying some of this stuff for me. I appreciate it.